Here we go. Charlotte, I don't know if you have club news or do you want to hand it over to Kendale? Charlotte, Charlotte, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, Dr. White's going to introduce the speaker. Okay, great. Dr. White? Dr. White, if you're ready to go, I think... Uh, all right, all right. Balls in your court. I'm, I'm, I'm Will. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Elena De La Vega as I guess. You were coming. Damn. Can, can I just... This evening, Dr. De La Vega is working at the University of Memphis. I'm gonna jump on this hot spot. Hold on. And here's Dr. De La Vega. <laughs> <laughs> I think Kendale will be back, or Dr. White will be back with us in just a, a moment. If I could ask folks, if you would, uh, I can go down and mute you all, but I feel uh, rather authoritarian doing that. If you wouldn't mind muting yourselves, during the presentation, but I mean, we'll leave it, of course, for you to be able to unmute as you have questions for our speaker. Um, I'll mute myself so you don't have to hear my dog whine um, here in just a moment. He has very lots of questions too. Um, as Dr. De La Vega was saying, I guess this is a, I'll turn my video back on until we see Kendale. Kind of a, a, a where we are in the pandemic is, I don't know how many of the rest of you have experienced this, but our, Work meetings include a lot more pets and children than they have in the past, and I'm, I think they're better for it. <laughs> but with vaccinations, we'll probably be able to all get together soon. That would be wonderful. And here's Dr. White. Dr. White, I think if you keep your, your video off uh, and then you can unmute yourself, we should, we should be able to hear you in the-, um, the Okay, can you, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you good. well, thank you. Okay, all right. I think if y'all can hear me, I can go ahead and start. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Elena De La Vega as our guest speaker this evening. Dr. De La Vega is an associate professor of social work at the University of Memphis. Go Tigers, go! Um, <laughs> she has served in this capacity since 2017. She also currently serves as the Masters of Social Work Program Director. In 2020, Dr. De La Vega. Uh, received the College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Re Research Award. This is just one of her many honors and awards she has earned throughout her career. At present, her research interests include the following areas, poverty and the intersection of oppression, marginalization and exclusion, the role of education, disabilities and ontologies. She is fully bilingual in English and Spanish. She loves history, art, political science, and a myriad of other subjects in her free time, she enjoys volunteering and visiting museums. Dr. De La Vega's goal is to contribute to the understanding and elimination of structural forms of poverty. She believes in service and outreach as evidenced by her curriculum vita. She is a published author, researcher, teacher, and lifelong learner. We all look forward to hearing your perspective and discussing your research and work in the community. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it and I appreciate your invitation. Uh, I will, without further ado, start my presentation. If you have any questions, please do interrupt and ask. Um, I have a lot of slides. I would go longer uh, rather than have misconceptions or um, I'd rather explain things if there are any questions. So uh, the purpose is to understand poverty this is based on my work and the work of Dr. Gregory Blumenthal, and we are co-authors of the Memphis Poverty Fact Sheet. And as I had mentioned, he's my husband as well. Uh, so this is where I am coming from. Um, as Adlai Stevenson said, a hungry man is not a free man. And this is something that is very important to keep in mind. The ability to make choices is severely impaired by poverty. I would like to define poverty 
first and foremost, because we often have misconceptions about what poverty is. And I have heard a number of things such as drugs or loneliness. And no, those are drugs and loneliness and they may or may not be associated or lead to poverty. Poverty is simply the lack of the necessary resources to meet one's needs, lack of money, period. That's why I have a period there because this is it. There may be other things that are associated and may lead to or not to poverty, but if one doesn't have money, one is poor, full stop. There is the absolute poverty, which is a threat to survival, social exclusion, we use a poverty threshold in the United States. I will explain that in a minute. And uh, when we're looking at world poverty, we use a threshold or people living on less than a dollar a day or less than $2 a day. In some cases, even $10 a day are mentioned. Um, and it's hunger, food insecurity and hunger. The way that we measure poverty in the United States as a method developed by Molly Orshansky in 1963 to 1964. It's used to this day. And the way that she came up with this, uh, she was working in the um, Department of Health and Human Services in Washington. And she and her boss were discussing the number of people in poverty and they just couldn't come up with a number because there was no measure. And they thought, well, if there were a way for us to say these people are poor and these people are not poor, then we could count the people in poverty. Um, and so they were thinking about this. They went to lunch and on the back of a napkin, she developed the measure that we use to this day. And it's basically the cost of three times food, that three times the cost of food for a month for or for a year for a family of four. So whatever it cost in 1963 for a family of four to eat a healthy, not luxurious, but healthy diet um, multiplied by three, that is your poverty measure. We still use that to this day, even though it's really inadequate now because there are a number of things that are more expensive today. Energy costs, housing costs, cell phones, 1963, no one had a cell phone. Um, so that changes the math. Now the cost of food is about one seventh of the family budget, but we still use this. These are the poverty thresholds that were uh, operational in 2019. I use this because the poverty fact sheet that I will show you utilizes 2019 numbers and is the most recent information. That's a 2020 census information. That is the most recent poverty measure that we have. And so people who in 2019 for family of four had less than 25,750 uh, were considered poor. This doesn't take into account such things as receipt of earned income tax credit or child credit or any other things that families may be receiving. So again, the measure is problematic, but it is the measure we use. So this is poverty in Memphis. Remember, this is before the pandemic. We will not know the impact of the pandemic until maybe the 2021 census numbers are published. Maybe we won't even know it then because 2021 numbers are 2020 um, measurements sometime in 2020, but that might not have affected everybody that it will affect. So we will have to look at 2021, perhaps even 2022 census numbers for us to really see, to be able to see the full impact. So that's an important thing. V note the disparities, the racial disparities. And child poverty, absolutely horrendous. And for African-American and Latino children, this is very horrible. You have a question, yes. 
Um, can you repeat your question? I think that may have been just an error over at OpenMind. Oh, okay, I'll go, I'll, I'll continue. And again, here we have the disparities, adult poverty. Uh, there are a couple of, and child poverty, there are a couple of things to observe. The first one is that Memphis, black poverty is actually higher than the United States, the state, or Shelby County. So there are not only disparities, but our black poverty is higher than in any other locations. And then when you look at white poverty, we're actually lower. So if you look at Tennessee, white poverty in Tennessee is higher than nationally and then in Memphis. So not only do we have great disparities, but the disparities are exacerbated by having much higher black poverty, much lower white poverty. And again, this is before the pandemic. And again, this is our map and you can see the infamous sea of Memphis poverty. Here we don't have a lot of poverty and the reason for this is because this has started gentrifying. This one here was a very fascinating thing. This, uh, this area has very high poverty, but it is uh, very, very white. And we were wondering, Dr. Blumenthal and I, what it is. Well, this area here is the airport and 76 people live in it. So otherwise you can definitely see the sea in Memphis and the association between race and poverty. The other thing that struck me this year is that we keep, you know, sub poverty goes down, poverty goes up, poverty goes down. And every year, for years, I, you know, call the newspapers and say, this year it went up, this year it went down, this year it went up. But if you look at over time, if you really look at the, it, it take a long view of poverty in Memphis, what's happening is that nothing is really changing. We had a bump um, in Hispanic poverty right uh, after we had the economic crash 2008, but it all seems to have gone back to normal and normal is racial disparities and high poverty. Again, this is before the pandemic. I don't expect the relationships to be different. And then there is relative poverty. And this is poverty compared to other people. This does not threaten survival. It's really social inequality. Now you might have tremendous social inequality and poverty. You may have tremendous um, uh, social inequality and not really poverty. The, the biggest problem is when we have this relative poverty in addition to existing uh, measurable poverty, absolute poverty. And when you combine the two, we have really explosive situations. So what happens is if you have a village in which everybody's poor and there is no social inequality, um, people don't realize how very poor they are. They may know they have needs, but they don't compare. Um, but when you have a situation such as Memphis, in which not only you have actual poverty and actual needs, but also the incredibly high social inequality that we have here, that creates a very explosive situation. And there is a number of uh, research pieces showing this, including the work of Dr. Burston in the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Memphis. Um, Social inequality is very problematic and I'll share a video with you. Um, please interrupt me if you cannot hear it. I may have to add. We're gonna have to reshare. Yeah, I'm gonna have to reshare. This is problematic, um, unfortunately. Where are we? 
Ah, I have to share sound. Okay. Oh, did it do it? Oh, no, I did something wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the correct one. On the upside, we could hear it. Oh, excellent, excellent. I was born in Den Bosch, where the painter Hieronymus Bos named himself after. And so I've always been very fond of this painter who lived and worked in the 15th century. And what is interesting about him in relation to morality is he lived at a time where religion's influence was waning. And he was sort of wondering, I think, what would happen with society if there was no religion or if there was less religion? And so he painted this famous painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, which some have interpreted as... I don't know what happened, but that wasn't the one I wanted to show you. It's really cool. It's not the one I wanted to show you. Ah, here it is. Okay, now we go. You need me to help you with this? No, I got it. I, I, I misclicked something. ...to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. I've always found that quite fascinating, but that is what inequality does. So um, let's say I am in a bad place. I need to get well, everything that doesn't work. Yeah, I need to get out of here. And now share again. So, um, this is where we are. So, um, inequality is very problematic, but when he decided to, uh, poverty, we also have increases in crime, increases in child mortality, which is a problem in Memphis, and a number of other consequences. 
And we have a number of terrible consequences to poverty and inequality. Uh, we have the consequences in education. It is very difficult for children to concentrate when they're not able to eat well. Uh, we had a terrible problem when we had uh, COVID. 80,000 children who used to get their meals from schools suddenly were not getting meals from anywhere. And there were a number of organizations who tried to provide meals, but they provided meals to eight or 9,000 students. So what happens to everybody else? And that just tells you the size of the need. There is hunger, there is the inability to have the resources we have. Again, what we saw during COVID is that a lot of children didn't have access to books, computers, uh, the opportunity to, to do schooling from home. And if they didn't have access to those schools, they were completely unable to see. But even when they can go to school and they have those resources, uh, people focus and children focus on their hunger, the need that maybe they can't sleep because they're sharing a room with 15 other people. Maybe they're in a very stressful neighborhood with a lot of trauma and maybe their parents are, uh, so stressed out from poverty and, and work and things like that, that, that they do not pay attention to the children. But if we want our children to do well in school, we have to do something about poverty. It's uh, fundamental. Uh, there are also a number of health consequences. We've, we've known this forever, uh, but particularly with COVID, we saw that people who had the health insurance were able to get better care than those who didn't. Uh, sometimes people got to work sick because they don't have any money. And then uh, unfortunately, a lot of drug use is self-medication for people who do not have access to mental health services. There are a number of consequences. We've all seen people who um, cannot afford their diabetes medication and they wait until they're almost in a diabetic coma before they go to the emergency room, costing thousand dollar, thousands of dollars to the taxpayer and shortening their lifespans. So there are a number of health consequences to poverty. Of course, malnutrition um, definitely involved a uh, lack of hygiene, lack of sanitation, lack of a safe place to sleep, so on and so forth. Um, and then there are um, the, the problems with, particularly when we add inequality to the mix, uh, violence, social instability, crime, violence, um, and a lot of these things that occur sometimes because people are under so much stress that they react very badly to situations that would not be so awful if they weren't under so much stress. So we do have an interest in eliminating poverty, self-interest, quite frankly, because I would like to live in a society that is healthier, where children are educated, where there is less violence and crime. So what causes poverty? There are a number of uh, reasons, but in general, researchers move this into the individual or internal and structural or external um, lock is mentioned. Um, the individual or internal causes simply say that the per, poor are different, different people. Poverty is a result of behavior. And the best way to help the poor is to change their attitudes. There are a number of uh, scholars who have, who have proposed this idea. Oscar Lewis, he actually coined the term culture of poverty, talking about people in Puerto Rico. The Moynihan Report on the Negro Family as well. And the most recent incarnation is the work of Ruby Payne, which is actually rather very famous here in Memphis, the framework for understanding poverty. Uh, structural causes are more like the lack of access, uh, lower wages. What kind of systems do we have? So one of the problems that we have here in Memphis would be the lack of public transportation and the difficulty people have in getting to work or getting to where their jobs or things such as um, food deserts where people are not able to find any reasonable food. Uh, part of uh, one of the problems with 
food deserts is that not only are all foods more expensive, high quality healthy foods are simply not available. And um, some people have mentioned luck. However, luck has a lot to do with the structural conditions that we have. So if somebody breaks a leg, but that somebody has um, healthcare and uh, access to wages while sick, then that person's not gonna end up in poverty. Uh, but if the structural supports are absent, then the bad luck of breaking your leg results in poverty. And there should not be anything unlucky at all about being born a woman that should not lead to poverty or being born black that should not lead to poverty. But these are structural conditions. Uh, when they lead to poverty, it's not bad luck. It is the structural conditions need to change. So uh, we attribute poverty then to the individual and their behavior, and this is a culture of poverty, or to structural causes, what systems are there in place, um, how does the economy promote poverty or not, the way that we have structured it. And uh, I've talked about it, so I'll skip that. But Ruby Payne talks about some of the traits of cultural poverty and why or how people would be, uh, would be poor due to their behaviors. A lot of these behaviors are not behaviors that occur uh, because one is this weird uh, monkey or subhuman or, you know, extraterrestrial. These behaviors occur simply because we're human. So one of the things that is said is that the poor focus on the short term and the idealized or dominant culture focus on the long term. And I'll stop saving for a minute because I really want to see your faces. Um, so one of the things that um, that's mentioned is that the poor cannot focus on the future. They do not plan for the future. But I want you to think about the last time that perhaps you were at the back of a plane, trying to exit the plane, perhaps ready to cross an international border and you really needed to pee. And you are at the back of that plane and there is nothing you can do but you need to go to the bathroom badly. What are you thinking? You're thinking, get me to a bathroom now. And somebody can tell you, oh, look, uh, there is a president of the United States three rows ahead of you. And what are you gonna say? I don't know, I don't care. I'm not gonna stop to get a picture right now. I want to go to the bathroom, bathroom first, right? And this is human, this is human behavior because we are made this way. When we are threatened, when our very survival is threatened, we're made to focus on that threat, our physiological needs are super important to our survival. And when those are threatened, we are made to focus on those, on meeting those needs. When people are in poverty and they haven't eaten or they're not sure about being able to eat next month or even tomorrow, they're not going to be focusing 20 years from now. They're going to be focusing on, I need to eat now, today. If I'm gonna lose my housing tomorrow, I'm not gonna be focusing on you know, I will buy Venetian blinds for the house that I intend to buy 20 years from now. I am going to focus about, I'm gonna lose my housing now and I'm gonna be sleeping on the street and I'm gonna probably die. And that is very human, we all do. The difference is that for most of us, it's just an occasional thing, like having to be in a bathroom or when you're boss ask you for a document that needs to be turned in today or maybe the day before taxes are due 
and we are in that situation. For poor people, this is an everyday, every moment of their lives. This is why children don't do well in school, because they're so worried about survival. Other things that are mentioned in this culture of poverty uh, is the investment strategy and whether the poor invest or not invest. Uh, well, in order to invest, you need to have money. You need to be able to save any money. If you have too much month at the end of your money, you may not be able to save anything. There have been a number of research studies where people get matches, uh, that the money is matched. One particular study involved mothers that were very carefully selected, about 200 of them. They uh, were followed for about three years. After three years, only about 5% of the mothers were able to save anything. And the average amount they had been able to save was $36. And what happens is this, maybe somebody is able to save 10 or $20 a month. Maybe they're able to do it for a few months, but then they have a blowout, their, their tires need replacing, or the kid needs shoes, or the kid needs a uniform, and that wipes their savings. So in order to be able to save, people need to make enough money to have a little bit left over. And I understand that, yes, when we think about somebody going to get a Starbucks every day, they could save that money. But there are people who are accounting for every penny and they're not able to save anything at all. And then uh, this one, the maintenance, I find rather offensive uh, because basically it says that the poor do not repair things while they idealize our dominant culture are self-reliant. This is offensive because the poor do repair their things. Now, they do not go to the Home Depot and buy the replacement part. They do not get, you know, an original part for their Lexus or whatever. They usually use duct tape or, you know, they might repair a, a broken window with a piece of cardboard because that is what they have. What they do not do is replace. They do repair but the repair may not look like much to us, uh, but it is a repair. Dr. De La Vega? Yes. I have a question about the investment strategy. I've seen in some places that they, you know, different programs have offered like a financial literacy program for people living in poverty. I'm wondering in your research or your experience, are those programs ever effective? And are there better, I mean, are there other alternatives that might be more useful for people who have so limited income that they can't really, you know, choose to invest it? So uh, in general, no, they do not work. Uh, financial literacy works for people who are ready to take that plunge. I'm gonna talk about bank accounts. We can talk about opening a bank account for poor people, but unless we create programs that are free to use for poor people, they're not going to use it. We can explain about banking all we want, but if you need to have $100 in order to open a bank account, that may be an insurmountable barrier. And if there is a $10 a month maintenance fee, that might also be an insurmountable barrier. And you know, people are gonna say, I, I can buy $10 worth more mac and cheese for my family, or I can give it to the bank. Why would I give it to the bank? Um, and then if you, for whatever reason, have a, you know, a, a bounce check, say that you thought that you had $240 in the bank, but then the maintenance fee comes and you have 230 and you made a $200 check for the rent and 10, uh, four $10 uh, dollar checks for the grocery store in the bank will not pay the 200 uh, the, the small checks first and then bounce the large one, they'll pay the large one and then bounce all the small ones. But all the small ones have a charge of $35 for each of them. So now, not only are you short the 10 for the, um, the, the maintenance fee that you didn't have to begin with, 
but you also have $105 in fees that you didn't expect. And that is almost impossible for some people to, to uh, get out of that financial hole. So they do not see bank accounts as useful. If we had bank accounts where uh, maybe the bank didn't pay that check or um, the, I don't know, we have to think of other strategies that help people begin to have a financial life that leads to middle class. First thing we need to do is really wages that allow people to have a, some sort of leftover money for saving. We need to invest in public transportation um, that allow people to actually have jobs. I think childcare is a very important thing. It allows mothers to go to work. So we can talk about banking until we are blue in the face, but still people are not going to take advantage of banking. We have to be more creative than the way that we've been. Training without um, the opportunity to practice what you've trained has been shown, and particularly uh, there was a meta-analysis which looks at all the studies that have been published in a certain amount of time. Uh, there was a meta-analysis that looked at the effectiveness of financial education, and what they found is people really benefit from financial education when they are at the moment of making use of it. So if you're going to buy a house, uh, that sort of training is very effective. If you're ready to start investment uh, investing or if you're ready to open an IRA, that's very good information. But otherwise, uh, people do just, it's, it's just too much information they don't remember. So we need other solutions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the problem with cultural poverty is that it maintains poverty because instead of really thinking about what the structural barriers people are having, it's really popular and appealing. And it gives people a goodwill, the feeling that we're doing something. So that's a lot of the problem with financial literacy. We think, oh, we're doing so much good. We're really not changing any of the system. So you have all of these financial literacy, people go and open a bank account, and then they start having problems with the fees and they abandon the bank account worse because if you've never had a bank account opening one might be easier now that you owe the bank 40 for you know 240 dollars which grows um it may be impossible for somebody to reopen a bank account because now they have all of that tarnish on their credit so that's uh that's something we really need to think about um, and if we don't think about creative solutions, what we're going to do is really create, all, continue all the negative outcomes that we have. That's why we see that Memphis poverty just continues to be pretty much the same. You know, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, but it continues. So we really need to think about what are the structural issues that we need to solve. Um, there are three different types of solutions to poverty. And so we can think of alleviative, the alleviative approach. The alleviative approach is sort of like, oh, we're going to mm, fix it a little bit so that people are not starving, starving. But uh, there's, you know, it sort of like takes the pain away, but it doesn't really solve it. Then there is a curative approach in which we know we have poverty and we are going to do something that is going to help people move out of poverty. And then there is a preventative approach, which is quite frankly my favorite, in which we prevent people from falling into poverty in the first place. The alleviative approach is welfare as we know it. So people get a little bit of money and then they're kind of trapped into it. And if, and I've seen this, people are on welfare and then they start trying to work, but then they lose our food stamps and what they're making is not enough. And they think, what do I do? So it's sort of the way that welfare and food stamps set up in this country kind of traps people. Um, the moment that they save a certain amount of money, they lose their health benefits. It's designed 
to not allow people to move on. And so, you know, we have the homeless shelters, food stamps, food banks, uh, charity, that takes the sting away. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take the sting away, but let's recognize it for what it is. A lot of the times um, before or in the process of implementing longer term solutions, we still have to make sure we take this thing away. Children need to eat today, even as we think about how do we prevent them from becoming poor in the future. So I understand there is a role, but it shouldn't be the only role. Then the curative approach would be asset building, savings programs, employment programs, case management could be useful if you have somebody who truly doesn't know how to utilize the, the systems um, that are needed. And then housing could be a curative approach if we provide more permanent housing or you know housing for at least a year or two years, uh, but while we help people build their assets. So something like a Habitat for Humanity is absolutely fabulous because what it does, it helps people build an asset um, and have their house by providing um, sweat equity. We have a lot of houses here in Memphis that are pretty abandoned. Uh, think about if we were creative with a lot of the properties and maybe we help people rehabilitate those houses. And the key here would, would be how can we get them to home ownership? Because people are going to take a lot of pride in something they own, but if they don't own it, then they're not invested in it. But, um, you know, we could eliminate blight and provide housing at the same time. And then there is a preventative approach. And we really have to think about the education and the quality of education. Social security is about the best anti-poverty program there is. Right now, poverty for older Americans on social security is about 10%, a little bit higher in Memphis. Um, but without social security, 50% of older Americans would be in poverty. So it does reduce poverty by 80%. Um, a living wage is very important. Uh, we talk about jobs, but if a job is not enough to actually eat, then it might not be sufficient. Universal healthcare is very important. I just uh, have experienced how important it is to have healthcare when one needs it. Um, and I remember that because I do have health insurance, I didn't worry about how much what I needed was going to cost. I just, you know, I was scared and so on and so forth. But I thought, well, if I need a treatment, I'll get it. And that is not true for everyone. There are a lot of people who are not in that situation. Credit programs, um, financial capability and financial training would be really good if people could also have access to credit. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, if you could buy one of those $30,000 houses in Orange Mound for the same conditions that somebody can buy a house, say in Germantown, maybe they could pay a couple hundred dollars a month. And a couple hundred, some, dollars a month, people could actually own their house and start building some capital. Public transportation and subsidized childcare are fundamental for allowing women to work. Uh, it, I love that uh, we could use eminent domain for something to help the people rather than, you know, a pipeline that is not even gonna help anybody here. I, I would actually prefer to, to replace, the, I have a question from Rick Baker. What do you think about replacing the existing safety net with guaranteed income? Uh, that would be a way. Um, people have talked about it. My preference would actually be to have um, access to credit, access to free banking, 
uh, free public transportation, free college, all sorts of supports. Uh, universal health care would be basic. Uh, supports for working people. And rather than universal income, I would like to see the government as, a, as employer of last resort. So I would like to see people making their money, earning their money. There are people who, for health condition, including mental health, cannot have a job. And I think we do have a responsibility to help them. But I think employee, government as employer of last resort would be a much better way because there is also a lot of satisfaction a lot of emotional well-being that comes from having a job. Everybody who has a job should be able to have, who wants a job should uh, have a job. Negative tax, uh, ne negative income tax idea is also really important. But I think that if we had all the, all the infrastructure, um, we would have a lot less poverty. And, what we want is a society in which everybody can contribute to. And I think that we sometimes forget the important contributions that poor people make. So when we think about COVID again, and oh boy, was this a test year. Um, of course, the doctors and the nurses and the researchers who brought us the vaccine are amazing, but what about all of those essential workers that kept us alive while the doctors and the nurses and the researchers were doing all the, yes, important work, but let's mm -hmm. recognize the important work of all the people who were cleaning doorknobs to make sure that we were safe, to all the people who were delivering groceries, um, all the people who were doing the tasks uh, that nobody else wanted to do, and are they recognized? And I think it's very important that we recognize their contribution and uh, give them the respect they deserve, but also pay the wages that they deserve. Because everybody contributes. I think that as a society, we often forget the contribution uh, that poor people have. So, uh, why, why do we need a, a living wage? So if, if you look at this, right now, the minimum wage, and you would have to work 50 to a uh, week, so no time off, no vacation, which is also necessary for health and mental health. Um, once you look at what people have after taxes, uh, it's impossible to live on that. When you look at raising the, the minimum wage to $15 an hour, that is closer to what we need to bring people out of poverty. And then there are, of course, all you know, the earning of tax credit and things that would bring people up. Here is the problem that we have with this. Instead of having a mechanism that would raise the minimum wage every year just by a couple of percentage points, We've waited for 11 years. The last time the minimum wage was raised was 2009. And so now we're saying, well, raise it to $15 an hour. And, and employers are saying, oh, well, my, my cost or, you know, my, my worker costs are going to go to double immediately. And so, yes, this is problematic. We need, we need to solve this, we need to solve it right away, and we need to start solving it now. Um, like I said, every year it should just go up. You know, if you raise it up three, four percent every year, it's much less painful for everyone. So, and this is a 2020 poverty threshold. So they've gone a little bit, but again, uh, we're never going to get here uh, if we think we don't start raising the minimum wage a little bit every year. Um, how can we remedy quality education? Uh, there are a number of ideas. Um, the, the quality of education is problematic because if all we do is testing all the time, there isn't an equality of education because all we do is testing. But we, the, there is an important thing that we are forgetting when it comes to education and it's uh, 
trade training. Uh, there are a lot of kids that are simply not interested in you know, algebra or other requirements of high school. And we require everybody to get a high school diploma, um, which is necessary for college. But what about if instead of making it the only option, we said you have two options. You can do this very academic thing, or you can learn a trade. And over the four years of high school, you can learn to be a mechanic, an electrician, a plumber, a cosmetologist. And these things are trades that will pay a living wage. You know, it could be coding, it could be any number of things. And I think that we are shooting ourselves in the foot by not considering those things as a high school curriculum that would graduate people at 18 with a marketable skill and maybe even a license. There are a lot of these profession, uh, professions need a license, but if, if you do it right in high school, um, we have to remember that 50% of the people are below the mean in education. And I don't mean to be rude, but the reality is that we can find something that is fulfilling and marketable and pays well for everyone, or we can decry that the quality of education is terrible forever. Not everyone is going to get algebra, and that is fine. But as a society, we need to understand that. So uh, this is actually what the Economic Policy Institute uh, calculated, that for people to be in the, in the middle class, uh, two adults with two children in Memphis, and this is for Memphis, and this is recently checked, they need 71,000, and that's to be in the middle class. So again, uh, we, we're far, far away. So we need to understand the economic context and the role of exclusion and discrimination, and then how the structures of society, such as education, healthcare, and public transportation are important. And yes, you do have responsibilities as citizens. And I think that this particular group understands that because you're here, because you formed and belong to an organization that cares and that tries to implement solutions. So, you know, I'm very, very happy that you invited me and that you're here and you really care about Memphis and you want to do something for Memphis. So, and you know, it's, it's health for everybody. And you know, I really care about health right now because of COVID. Uh, we should always care. So, um, oh wow, this is a lot. It's hard to pull up, uh, up by your bootstraps when you don't have any boots. Exactly. Systemic bar barriers seem to persist just in new forms. It seems that post-Civil War sharecroppers and tenant farmers were so often black, but under Jim Crow, even after the New Deal, Social Security and fair labor laws uh, excluded agricultural and domestic workers. Absolutely true, mainly black people. This is so incredibly true. So you have a domestic worker, black woman working as a domestic worker for years in 1950, 1960, 1970. Now she's an old woman and she doesn't qualify for social security because she was excluded from that system because she was a domestic worker. She work, worked all her life and yet she has no support. Absolutely. Thank you for saying this. This is, this is absolutely true. Uh, lower minimum wages, um, no maximum work week, no overtime. Absolutely. This is all true in farm work. This is all true in uh, domestic work. Uh, and then the unfair USDA programs that shut out black farmers, denied loans. And again, that's why I think credit is very important. People without access to appropriate low cost credit are excluded from the economy in this country. Absolutely. Suppliers also making sure that the discrimination is not there and that there is uh, fairness. Um, 
And, and so finding, I, I agree, finding solutions that undo the past wrong seems so hard. So, but, but what we can do is say, okay, so labor laws did not apply to everyone. Let's make sure they apply to everyone now. Lack of credit excluded many people. Let's make sure credit is available to everyone now. Um, so no, we cannot change the past but we can change the future. And that, that's true. We need to recognize that, that uh, generally those who are at the top are invested in the status quo. But, uh, but that's the thing. Um, I, I generally uh, don't want to, I mean, I, I recognize all the bad structural problems in the past. I don't think punishing people is a good idea, but I think that we say, if we say, look, uh, there were all of these problems, let's make absolutely sure that we don't have them anymore. So we know that, uh, are, are there any ways to recognize domestic workers? You know, are there, is there any way to ask somebody, uh, you were a domestic worker, you didn't um, pay into social security because it wasn't done, but we're gonna recognize you. We're gonna recognize that you worked and provide a social security payment that is actually a living payment. We could do that. Uh, we could say our credit program excluded uh, farm, you know, black, Farm uh, from workers. How can we make sure, you know, maybe you acquired a lot of debt, looking at how people acquire that debt and saying, you know, if the way that you acquire your debt was because of unfair practices in the past, maybe there are ways to forgive the debt. So we could do things even today to, to look at that. And, and again, um, it's difficult when we think about, well, I live on a house that was owned by the Choctaw. Do I return my land to the Choctaw when I bought my house legally? Well, again, that's not realistic. So there are some things that are not going to be realistic. But what we can do is make sure that people have access to low cost credit. We can make sure that wages are good. We can make sure that you know, older Americans that were not able to participate in social security still receive a social security payment. And we do have to be creative. Uh, but what we have to do is think of ways that build wealth. So again, one of the things, and, and I keep saying this, we have so many abandoned, abandoned houses. They're not any, you know, they're nuisances for the city. They, they are, blight for the city. Why can't we allow somebody to, to buy it for very little money and say, you know, it's yours, free and clear, fix it. And maybe we can check it. You know, we'll come every month or every six months and see what improvements you've done. And if you have not improved it, then we'll give it to the next person. But, you know, we could do a lot of things that could help people without punishing people. Yes, Carl, um, I guess you're next. I'm, not I'm Pan, I'm Pan, but I, that's Carl. <laughs> um, we, we are together. Two things, first, uh, Tim Boulding, who uh, unfortunately is deceased now, used to run United Housing. And I used to have a program where we took people around the city and he talked a lot about the, this housing question. Mm -hmm. and, and the abandoned houses and such. And he made clear at that time, and I'm sorry, but it's older news to me. And I'd like to know if anybody else here knows now, those houses are very hard to track down for ownership. They are yes. not just free and clear at the cities to say, here's a house. And mm -hmm. they spent on, on an inordinate amount of time and still do, as far as I know, trying to find the owners of the houses and trying to get the owners, you know, there's a whole procedure to make those houses available. And it may be the, the right and proper thing to do, but after a certain amount of time, you know, how, how long do you look? Do you look for 10 years? 
right. do you live for a year? There has to be a moment that yeah. the houses are cleared. And right. once the houses are clear, is there any way to give them to a family who will take care of the house? Could I answer that question? Yes. Uh, about, uh, oh, I, lo I lose track of time, but I think within the last two years, uh, motivated by the uh, lobbying and, and uh, draftsmanship of the uh, Neighborhood Preservation Organization, the state legislature uh, passed a, a, a law that applies only to Shelby and Davidson David counties, I believe, that allows the city to go after those houses in a condemnation type proceeding where they don't have to find the owners. So we That's do now have on our books in Tennessee a way of doing that. Now we need to find somebody who's willing to do it. You know, somebody yeah. in city government or uh, county government uh, who will be an agency that will actually do that. But, but this has, there has been some progress on that uh, motivated by, by the work of, of neighborhood preservation. That's helpful, Jim. That, Thank you. That is very helpful. And then uh, maybe getting, you know, organized and what a wonderful group of people I have in front of me uh, to make, you know, make those houses. Now, what I would like to see is that a house is made available uh, for very little to a family who will take care of the house. Now imagine that you have a house, a neighborhood that it's so blighted and horrible, and you put 10 families on a street or 20 families on a street with blighted houses. And you say, what we would like for you to do is, you know, keep it clean, keep it uh, repaired, start repairing. And we may have to find some sort of inexpensive credit for people to be able to afford the, you know, repair materials and paint and whatever is needed, but what you had was a horrible, blighted, dangerous drug housing neighborhood. And now what you have is a neighborhood that it starts growing where healthy families can live and think about the impact, the spillover impact that that is going to have on the school district. If what you have is 10 families or 20 families committed to their house, to their neighborhood. So that, that would be a really creative solution. And it, quite frankly, it would cost the city nothing because that's blighted property already. Absolutely. Yeah, I uh, had a question in the chat I think you may have missed. Mm -hmm. uh, the birth rate on among low-income women, regardless of race, it's substantially higher than the other income brackets. And I love your solutions. I do, do believe that we've got to increase the wages and all the structural um, structural issues, but shouldn't that any solution have incur encouraged family planning? As well, long I as- yeah. I agree. Yeah. And uh, part of the problem is that the education that we have is abstinence only. And again- right. The state not, legislature but, won't, won't allow that, but there, there are other programs. Yeah, and that's not realistic. That's not. just not realistic. So yes, I would I would like to see family planning to be a solution and uh, a lot more programs with young teenagers. Uh, not only the girls, the girls have the consequences, mm. but the boys. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, we don't do that. Uh, one of the things that I like to do on campus is that I go to Planned Parenthood and I get a bag with uh, condoms to put in an in, in a trusted place uh, uh, on my in my department, and we may disagree as to what's moral or what's immoral, but young people are young people are they're going to do what they're going to do, and I'd rather not have consequences. Yeah, I would suggest that you might want to look at the. A step ahead foundation with the lo long term right. reversible contraceptives, mm -hmm. which is a um, it's like a patch. It's it's an incredible, incredible technology, and they are have a very effective rate uh, of, uh, yeah. of of reducing on on, on early teenage pre pregnancy. It's a it, it's a very effective program. And and at the same time, and I'll get to you, Pam, in a minute. Sure. Um, uh, one of the things is that um, teen pregnancy has actually come down yes. in recent years. So it's not as we have a lot more work to do, 
but I think it does work. Now, one of the things that works is um, public information campaigns, and we don't do that. So I remember when I was growing up in Mexico City, we had all of these public inf information campaigns about uh, small families are better. My generation has a maximum of two kids and a lot of them we have one. Uh, and that, that was something that was strange to me, but other things such as save water, save water, and people who grew up in Mexico City, of course, because we didn't have a lot of water, um, we, we are very cautious about, you know, open your faucet, close it right away, the five minute shower. And it's so because all of these messages get repeated. People need to hear the same message about 10 times before they even begin to hear you. Pam. Well, a, a very long-term solution can <laughs> come through education. I mean, what Denise wrote earlier in the chat, uh, all the things that she mentioned, which are, are true, uh, they aren't things that are normally taught or that I was taught or that are being taught now. In fact, our state legislature is trying to prevent us from teaching certain kinds of things now. Uh, but I, I really feel that there's information, historical, factual information about yes. how Social Security is built, how the Farm Act was built, and how these things are that are just, they're not partisan. Uh, uh, they are partisan, but they're not political. You know what I mean? Or they're not, they are political, but they're not partisan. That's what I mean. And so, I think we need to educate people at a, at a young age and keep educating them uh, about our true history so that we have on board. And that, that goes for the more wealthy students as well in oh, private schools. Yes. And, so and, that and, they understand and they don't give you these platitudes about, well, they're just lazy and they, or they're just getting money from welfare and all that other junk. You know, well, just, and we all want to live in a better world. And you're absolutely yeah. correct, Pam. And Char, hand. Yeah, uh, one, one thing that I thought about as you were discussing housing next week, yeah, next week we'll have Paul Young as our speaker. Mm -hmm. And he was over what housing and community development and has started quite a few things. Uh, and now he's with the downtown commission. So I'm not sure where that will go, but a lot of the conversation that we've had tonight and some of the questions, maybe we can even pick his brain a little bit more for that. And you're perfectly and welcome to come. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, because I think some, even though he's not, I think he's just made the transition, he still might have influence in that area because how can you build wealth without property? I keep thinking, okay, what could you, what, I mean, you could maybe get what, uh, some kind of miss, some kind of fortune or uh, some kind of lottery, but housing and credit go together. Oh, absolutely. It, that's how the middle class is built. Uh, absolutely, it's it's housing, and so there are. And like I said, you can go get a house that is three hundred thousand dollars in you know Germantown or whatever, or East Memphis or Bartlett or whatever, and uh, that the current uh, interest rates it's less than two thousand dollars per month. Uh, but if you try to buy a thirty thousand dollar house. Uh, you're not going to be able to get that credit at all. The banks don't even want to issue those credits. So I think that the, uh, that's a role for maybe the government to intervene and say, okay, we'll secure those credits. People that receive tiny, the microcredits, the research has shown that they pay 97%. That, that's a higher repayment rate than even for people who make more money. But we don't make it easy for people in poverty to get out of it, like really right. get out of it. Right, well, we'll be sure and invite you uh, and you and Dr. Greg, and maybe you can chime in and we can just continue this. And this is a great brainstorm. Who knows what ideas we might come up that we can push even further. I cannot but think it, of a better group to implement and lobby and, thank and you. push and, for those ideas. And remember, we are inviting you to our social hour. We call it the happy hour. So we'll stay in touch. Any other questions? Dr. D, this has been quite, and not only an inspirational, but a motivational session. Thank because you. sometimes we get caught up in our own world and we sort of forget that there are people and their needs around us. 
and you have reminded us of that. And we appre okay. really appreciate everything that you've done and everything that you're doing. And every year we want you to come back and give us another comedy back. report on whatever year. Yeah. All the time. And I do apologize for last week. Oh, uh, no, that's okay. I'm still recovering. Right. We're just happy that you're here now. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank we did, you but so we didn't much. want to cancel. We didn't want to cancel. So whenever you were ready, we wanted you to be here. Thank you so much. This has been this has been essential for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You might want to stay in here. You might want to stay in here our uh, current service pro project that we have rolling with attorney Al, Al Harvey. Al, okay, you want to share I'll that with us? Right. I do have another meeting shortly. I'll stay a few minutes. Okay, yeah, you'll you'll like this. Al? Right. This is our uh, this is our project uh, that we're working called Socks for Vets, and we are supplying uh, uh, lots of socks for the VA Hospital Memphis. Now, we are on the uh, tail end of the drive. I, can, I was at Mike Simpson's house just the other day, about three or four days ago. His whole front room is full of socks. Uh, he left to go on a trip. He'll be back, uh, I think, sometime this week. And as soon as he gets back, uh, we can have a full count and then a full report to the club. But I can tell you that we're close to our goal and we could really appreciate uh, another big push. Thanks to all who have donated so far. Uh, ben Jabour has a, a trunk full of socks that he got from one of our uh, brother clubs. And uh, that's going to help tremendously. And we have, uh, as I say, almost reached it. And so if you can make a real effort uh, this week to bring some socks to uh, Mike's uh, home at 1355 Peabody, you can put them on the porch uh, and, or if Mike's home, he'll be glad to accept them. So thanks to everybody for what they've done. And we look forward to a full report next week. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. We start. Our, we started our goal with a hundred airs, <laughs> and then we kept moving up, 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 and now we at more than six hundred pairs of socks. Wow! So we're doing great, and so that, and we know that a lot of vets are um, homeless and live in poverty too. So I thought you'd like to. I thought you'd be glad, and I could get some joy out of hearing that, Doctor D. Yeah, that you know, homeless vet. Oh. That that is such a horrible oxymoron. Yeah, sure is. we'll check with you next year for your socks. <laughs> Thank you. I will. I love socks. My favorite Thank gift. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great you again. evening. Bye. Okay. Good night. Um, Good night. And then for next week we have oh Paul Young who can well he's a man about town so he can talk housing and community development and now he's at the downtown commission and. Um, so we've been going back and forth, you know, with him and the different numbers and all. And I'm calling him on this cell number. I thought that actually the cell number I was calling was the cell number connected to the Memphis City. And so he called to see was he still on. And I tried to call him back. But anyway, we're in good shape because now I have his downtown commission cell phone. So he'll be here tomorrow. I mean, next Tuesday. And so we'll be able to hear maybe, maybe two subjects. And Allison is with us tonight. Thank you, Allison. Welcome, Allison. Hi, everybody. Good to be well, here. family. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and BJ is with us. Hi, everyone. Great yeah. meeting. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so we've gained a lot from that. And some of this we might even be able to use next year as we think of service projects with just some of the information we've been given tonight. So uh, any, any other announcements? Al, thank you, thank you, thank you once again for being the sock man. We really appreciate that and your committee. Okay, Will? Um, just to put it out there, uh, to encourage folks, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, to really encourage you to get vaccinated. Um, I think it's accessible to all of us on the uh, call tonight. If it's any additional motivation, um, the school is re-evaluating um, our access as a club to the facilities on campus. And if we're able to show that we are um, vaccinated 
it would be a lot more helpful, or at least, you know, in, in, in our, not, if not entirety vaccinated in, in the vast majority, uh, though I understand that there are some, you know, real, um, real good reasons why people may not get vaccinated for medical purposes, so, or religious purposes, but for that, those things aside, um, if, if you're, you know, able to do so, I encourage it, and then hopefully we can re reconvene in person sometime this summer. Um, it looks like the timetable is moving up a little bit. Charlotte, that's news to you right now too, but um, I hope we can all get, get together soon. Thanks, Will. Maybe, they, maybe Denise can put that in the next uh, meeting announcement. Yeah, I, I think it would be smart to, no matter where we're meeting, you know, to say that the more of us that are vaccinated, the easier it is for us to meet in person. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's great. All right. I'll try to remember. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Hi. you, thank you. Love Hi, Yolanda. Everyone. I haven't seen Yolanda forever. Hi. Yeah. Hey there. Hey, you <laughs> yeah. So great seeing you, Yolanda. <laughs> so good How's everybody? everybody? Everybody's great. Yeah, yeah. We're good. Thank you. So we've had a, a very interesting night with lots of lots on our brains to go and think about. So let's go and serve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for such a great speaker. Uh, Thank you. Okay. We'll just keep we'll just keep plugging. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye.